Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of the Prove Me Wrong podcast. I'm your host, Pete Lieb. I've got a great discussion tonight lined up, and I'm glad you're all on board with me. We are going to talk some sports tonight, okay? Finally, we're going to, you know, a break from the action, a little bit different, talk some sports. More specifically, we're going to talk about the origins of the National Football League. Um, being a red-blooded American male, sports are incredibly important to me like they are to millions of men, women, and children all over the country. You know, any given Sunday, you'll see, normally, you would see thousands of people gathering together and, and to cheer on their hometown team. It really is a part of what of American society. Uh, but the world has really been kind of thrown off schedule this year, specifically by, that, by the stay-at-home orders and the you know, non-essential businesses closing up due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it really hit home for me that this virus was potentially very serious when sporting leagues started to shut down. Uh, I believe it was um, the NBA initially and the NHL and then the M uh, Major League Baseball sh shut down their spring training and then event and then uh, the NFL as well, kind of their off-season stuff, music concerts, and then suddenly the whole world shut down from that point on. The sporting world has disappeared now for a couple of months, and for people like me, sports fans, the silence has been deafening. So now that we start get some indications that maybe these uh, restrictions are letting up a little bit, we may start seeing some, some action here soon. I thought it was a great time to pick back up with a sports-related topic tonight. And what better topic to cover than how the NFL was founded, who were the men that stood it up, and what were the challenges they faced? To do that with me, my guest tonight is Mr. John Eisenberg. John is a sports author and current opinion columnist for the Baltimore Ravens. And we are going to talk about his book titled The League, How Five Rivals Created the NFL and Launched a Sports Empire. John has spent almost three decades as a sports columnist for the Dallas Times Herald and the Baltimore Sun. He published his first book, The Longest Shot, in 1996. It was about an unlucky Kentucky or an unlikely Kentucky Derby winner, Lil E.T., and has written 10 books now in total regarding baseball, horse racing, and several on the NFL, including uh, the subject we're going to discuss tonight. You can find more on John on his website, johneisenberg.com, and you can find his books on amazon.com as well. So welcome, John, to the Prove Me Wrong podcast. Well, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Happy to uh, talk about this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Like I said, this is this is like a um, a warm blanket for me. I really uh, have been looking forward to to uh, just breaking up what we've been. Every, the world has been under so much the last couple of months, and sports are really an escape for a lot of people. And it's really important to a lot of people just so they don't think about what's going on around them. They can focus for a couple hours on the game and and forget their troubles. And before we travel back in time, if we could spend just a moment uh, in the present and your work right now for the Ravens, how have these restrictions or how do those restrictions affect what the day-to-day -day operations were in the NFL franchise? I know that the players were not allowed to be around, I'm assuming, but what was the effect of all of these restrictions on the NFL? Well, my experience, <clears throat> I mean, you know, and I'm, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a writer on the digital media side, you know, I'm one of the low men on the totem pole, don't get me started on that, I mean, yeah. very definitely, so, but uh, what happened was there in the second week of March, they closed the facility, uh, the, the Ravens practice, a very nice state-of-the-art facility uh, in suburban Baltimore, and it closed, just like every place else, and uh, the orders were, work from home. And uh, I think the coaches did it. I mean, the players, I mean, the NFL was different from these other leagues in that it was the off season. So uh, the players were gone already. They didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, what are we going to do in real time almost? I mean, they had plenty of time to sort of sort through this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the off season, there's all this stuff that goes on, the, the combine, the draft, the, 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 the various steps of, of the usual off season, the off season program, these spring practices, so those have been impacted, but no games. And, and the players have not been on, uh, even in a normal year, where they've just been back on the premises. So uh, people like me and, and everybody else, uh, marketing, PR, everybody, you know, it basically was get out of here. Yeah. And so uh, I've been working from home since mid-March. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the website, uh, the NFL has continued. I mean, the draft, 
and, and everything. So I've just continued to write uh, like there's going to be a season because there, everything else is just speculation. There's no telling what's going to happen. I don't think the league knows yet what's going to happen. So, and then the draft and the formation of the roster for this coming year and how things are going to be. And, you know, the Ravens have a very sort of young and exciting team and fan, fans are excited about them. So it, it wasn't too hard to just keep doing that just strictly from home though. So going back to what you had mentioned, you talked about the draft and I watched the, the draft and it was unprecedented, right? It was a, a, basically a zoom draft, you know, right. it was a remote uh, viewing draft. How did from from your standpoint, how was that received? I mean, how did that, obviously it was something we had to do. We didn't really have much choice, but how did you feel that was, that that went over? Well, I wrote this. I thought it was great. Yeah. I, I just, I thought it was sort of, people thought, well, that may, it's going to lack humanity with uh, no person, person contact. And I kind of thought it was the opposite that came true. We suddenly were looking at everybody's living rooms and and uh, Bill Belichick's dog and, yeah. and was making draft picks and and Mike Frabel, whatever was going on in his house with uh, <laughs> the teenagers. I mean, I thought it was funny. Yeah. And so you you had just this living room after living room, players as well as personnel. I, I enjoyed it. I thought they're home, uh, they're with their families. Uh, yeah. You're seeing general managers making draft picks with their eight-year-olds in their laps. And I just, I thought it was kind of cool. No, you, no, I agree with you there. For, for From that aspect, to be able to see these people as real people, and they have real families, and again, Mike Vrabel, um, with, with what was going on there, it's funny, because I went to Ohio State, and so Mike Vrabel, I've, I've known him, he was in school when I was in school, so I've kind of known him forever, uh, uh, but it's, it's just kind of funny to see that, but you're right, I, I, I watched it, it was no different for me, I'm never at the draft, I'm always watching it on television, so... Um, it was kind of interesting to see the general manager, see coaches. Did anybody really expect Bill Belichick to ever be sitting in his chair on camera? I didn't. Um, but no, I, I just wondered how, how it was taken kind of in the inner circle there, how they all felt that worked out. It sounds like it was still pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I think people were, were, were touched by it. I do think as this goes on, I think the executives, the general manager, the scouts, the coaches, I think they're getting a little cabin fever like no different than anyone else. Right. I mean, Absolutely. we've all got cabin fever. Uh, and so I, I do think that it's having an impact. And of course, they're not able to coach their players. And I, I think they're doing these virtual practices and workouts. And I'm sure that's fine. So as time goes on, I think it's getting a little long uh, for them. However, I mean, you know, it needed to be done. And, and as it was happening back then, I, I think they were fine. How much practicing would they be doing now anyway? How much actual physical contact would they be having right now? Well, no contact. Yeah. Uh, it would be the spring practices are what they call organized team activities. Uh, it's like three, a succession of weeks, four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, one is just for rookies and then the veterans come in and then there's a mini camp at the end that's mandatory. I think it's actually six weeks of usually Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday practices, something like that. They have weeks uh, where they can just coach them. It, it's, it's like uh, they're in shorts and helmets, and um, it's a lot of what they call install. I mean, they're, they're working on the playbook, and they're putting yeah. things together, and mechanics of young players and things like that. So uh, five or six weeks of, of pretty serious stuff going on in terms of learning the playbook, stuff that would uh, have an impact in the fall. And I guess they can get to some of that by a Zoom or whatever, but uh, they are missing some some key time in that regard my only concern with it was we we also just expanded the the season now right i mean we also added another game to the season um right, not for this year oh okay so that's that's that next year right right not for this year so either way i was thinking to myself um you know with this time off and this lack of physical activity you know, is that going to show up on the on the injury report? Are you going to have individuals who, you know, you're kind of rushing yourself back into the season to make up for lost time? Is that going to result in an increase in injuries this year? I mean, I don't know. It remains to be seen, but that's what I thought. Usually whenever you're, because boy, there's that temptation to just rush back in and say, you know, here we go. Week one, we're, we're ready to go. We're on time. But you didn't do a lot of those preparations that needed to be done prior. So, it, um We'll see. Well, It'll be interesting. We will see. Uh, uh, my understanding at this point 
is that uh, training camps, the, the, the teams think they're going to open training camps uh, this summer. Okay. Uh, I mean, they, they have no reason not to plan for that right now. Okay. And so those do have con- that those their contact practices in there. So they will have missed the spring. They could pick back up in the midsummer and practice until a season were to begin at some point in the fall. So there will be contact. They will have missed the spring. We'll we'll see whether it matters. There's going to be injuries anyway. Well, slots. sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so okay. So we'll see. Okay. So the league. How did you become attracted to the idea of writing the league? How did you get involved in writing the book? Well, I had written uh, three or four books of pro football history. Uh, wrote one on Vince Lombardi's first year in Green Bay, just strictly on the first year when he came in and sort of started, put the wheels in motion of that dynasty, just drilling down to that one year. And then I'm originally a Texan, uh, mm-hmm. grew up in Dallas, and I wrote a couple books about the early days of the Cowboys, uh, which was the team I chipped for growing up. And so I was familiar with history, and I've been a sports writer forever and, and, and loved it. And I actually got a phone call uh, from uh, my uh, literary agent in New York and said, hey, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a publisher that's looking to do a book on the early days of pro football. Do you have a writer? Said that to my agent. My agent said, well, yeah, I do, and called me. Are you interested? And I said, yes. I had always sort of been fascinated by the very early, earliest days of the NFL uh, just because I, I knew enough to know it was so, uh, so unlike what the NFL is like today, mm-hmm. just ridiculously different. I mean, it was a failing enterprise, really. Uh, it was a minor sport, uh, way behind baseball, way behind minor league baseball, horse racing, boxing, many, many other sports were more popular. And there was no money on the table. No one really cared. The games weren't very interesting. And I thought, how in the world did we get from there? That's point A. How do we get from there to where we are now, where it's 16 billion or whatever it is in annual revenues and and uh, uh, the number one sport by far and s- such an obsession? And I, I just thought it would be interesting to explore that. Really, how long did it take them to sort of get their feet on the ground? Because it was such a fly by night, basically a fly by night enterprise. So. Uh, I decided, they asked me, what would your story be? I said, I don't want to write about the personalities of players. Those have already been done. Right. Uh, I want to write this story. How in the world did we get from point A to point B? And they said, great. So off I went. So what was the genesis of the idea? You know, you just rattled off all the reasons why at the time it was a, it was a, failing, uh, a failing venture. What was the genesis of that idea for the National Football League? Whose brainchild was it originally? And you know, what existed prior to kind of a, the organization of the league? Well, there were, there were a few little uh, pro football, paid football, as they called it. There were a few little leagues around. There were semi-pro leagues, basically. A lot of them were in Western Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And there was one in Ohio. Little towns had teams and, and uh, industrial teams. A, a company would have a team. Uh, and they would, there were, they were big company leagues in the Midwest, and uh, YMCA's had teams. There, were, there was a little bit of paid football. And so really what happened was the people in Ohio just said, uh, Ralph Hay, who ran the Canton Bulldogs, said, uh, let's have a meeting. Let's, uh, let's have a little more organization here, maybe. How about a little bit more? And so some guys showed up. That's yeah. basically what happened. And there were 10 guys in an auto showroom. Uh, George Hallis of the Bears was one of them. Uh, they had some beer. They sat there one night. They t- set up a, some rules. They elected Jim Thorpe as president, who had never done anything other than play sports. And so they just said, well, let's try to give this a little more organization and see what happens. And, and so, you know, they, they left a lot of boxes unchecked, mm-hmm. which is why it was such a fly-by-night enterprise for so long. So George Hallison was, was one of the true founders. He was one of the yes. first people that were there. The other four that you're talking about in your book came a little bit later, right? Who, who were the other four that we're talking about? Just so that the... the... Yes. Uh, the other four that I, I, I write about, uh, one is Tim Mara, uh-huh. who's the uh, founder of the New York Giants in right. 1925. He was a bookie. Uh, was a legal bookmaker. 
Uh, then George Preston Marshall, who founded the Redskins in 1933, uh, 32, I'm sorry. They were the Boston Redskins originally for five years before they moved to Washington. Um, the next one is Burt Bell, who uh, joined the league in 1933, started the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and he was uh, a son of real wealth, mainline Philadelphia. He'd already blown his money pretty much by the time he started the Eagles. He had to borrow money from his future wife to start the Eagles. But, uh, he, and he's a key figure. He was later commissioner of the NFL, started the Eagles. And the last one is Art Rooney, mm -hmm. who started the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, they were the Pirates for seven years. And, uh, and so uh, those are the five guys. And I zeroed in on them. I really thought about this before I started. Who am I going to, who were the, who, who kept this league going? How did it make it? You pretty much, you go to Canton, what you do, and you're in my position, you go to Canton, Ohio, the Hall of Fame. They have a library. They have archives there. There's a book that does not leave that premises, and it is the minutes of every meeting that has ever taken place wow. in the NFL. Official meeting, official minutes, so starting with the first one uh, that night in Canton, Ohio. So you can go and you can read that, and their voices come alive. You can really see what people said, who had influence, what the rules were. And so after sort of going through that, I said, these are the five guys really that just carried this league uh, through, you get through the first 10 years where it was really not doing so well. And the thirties is when they sort of started the other four gentlemen or three, the last three I mentioned mm -hmm. got in with the first two. And suddenly there was a group there of sort of sportsmen who said, we, we can move this thing forward. We're going to try and so that's when it all started. So the, I just zeroed in on five owners who were, were basically were the National Football League. So one thing that really jumped out at me there, do you have to have a press pass to go in and actually read that thing? Or can anybody who goes to the Hall of Fame read the minutes oh. of, the, of that meeting? I think you have to set up, uh, it's different. Uh, I've done baseball books too. If you go to uh -huh. Cooperstown, you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, I think you can walk into the library there. Did and that? say, hey, I'd like to see if they have a folder there on everybody yeah. who's ever swung a bat or thrown a pitch in a major league game. You can yeah. go and say, hey, I want to see the folder on, uh, you know, whoever that played for the St. Louis Browns in uh, 1948. You can you can get that. But the NFL, I think I think it can't. You have to make an appointment and, and especially to see rare stuff like that. Yeah, because that to me is su simply fascinating because most of history is really based on the person who wrote it. So, uh, you know, a lot of times you, you may think you have an impression of somebody, but it may have just been somebody else's interpretation of right. that person. But you're talking about being able to actually physically go there and look at the minutes from the from the book, the, the hundred year old book at this point and, right. and really kind of see real life. That to me is is really super awesome. I didn't realize that was there. That's really neat. Um, how did they you were talking about the beginning, the first 10 years. How did they draw players? I mean. I've, I've read that colleges, even back in the early 1900s, they were even paying players at that time to play college. I don't know if, you, if you've if you heard that as well, sure. but how how difficult was it to just obtain the right people? I mean, the game was incredibly violent and, and um, uh, dangerous, right? I mean, was, was there a lot of incentive for people to pick that up professionally? Yeah, the real danger and uh, the whole story in the early 1900s when supposedly Teddy Roosevelt stepped in and uh, the, the sport was people, college kids were dying on right. the football yeah. field. And uh, they formed the NCAA as a result of that, uh, what became the NCAA and put in some regulations. And that, that was like 1905. So we're, we're talking about 15 years later when the NFL started. And I think there was less death, I mean, for well, that, lack good. of a better way to put it. Uh, in the, so it was just a game. It was still a violent game. But the NFL faced numerous, I mean, playing professionally. What you have to understand, what really shocked me in researching this was the biggest obstacle they faced was the whole idea of paying people to play football. Um, Football, if you, uh, I mean, to, to get into sort of the, 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 the background of it and its role in society, going back to the 1800s, late 1800s, when it started up, it was popular on college campuses. It grew popular in high schools and it was seen as a proving ground or a training ground really for young boys. Mm -hmm. In lieu of real uh, military battle, 
uh, you put them on the gridiron and you taught them how to be men. There were rules. You didn't come off the field. It was a game of endurance. It was tough. It was supposed to teach America's boys how to be men, young men. That was how people saw football. It was different than baseball and very physical. And so when pro football started up in 1920, and you could find the unbelievable, the coaches, the college coaches just screamed their heads off. It was like, this is the worst thing that has ever happened. And there were a lot of columnists, very influential, that said, you should never do this. You're going to ruin football if you're going to pay people to, to play this game. And so that lasted for years. It lasted for years. They fought. I found quotes from George Hallis saying, we're never going to compete with college football. We don't want to try to compete with college football. We're, we're just here to have a little game. And, and so the whole idea of paid football was just the, the people were horrified by it for, well, 10 or 15 years. That seems super odd that, that there, are, there were other paid sports. There were other paid entertainers. I mean, these guys are, they're entertainers. They're out there entertaining you. You're sitting back and watching it, uh, that you wouldn't be paid. That, that seems really amazing to me that, that that would somehow cheapen the experience of playing football if we paid you to do it. You know, that's supposed to be just for you to, to be a man. It's not supposed to actually make a living. Because yeah. uh, um, I actually didn't the first... Um, the first Heisman Trophy winner didn't even go into football, right? I mean, he uh, he went into business instead because it just it yes, wasn't lucrative enough. So that's th right, Jay Jay, Jay Berwanger. That's right. So how so did, how long do you think it took? How long did it actually take for them to really be able to show that these these young men coming out of college, you you have a future if you are an athlete of a certain caliber, you have a future in the NFL. How long did that take before they were actually really able to say? you know, for these guys to see that I'm not going to go work for dad. I'm going to go play for the bears. Well, it was a process of course. And, uh, you look in the thirties, uh, several teams had gained some traction by then. The, the giants were drawing very nicely in New mm -hmm. York. Uh, the bears, uh, Alice's team was drawing pretty nicely. Uh, there was a sport, there was a sport. It was, uh, there were a few places where it was doing okay, even in the depression. And, so I, th I, at that point, uh, what really happened, see, for those, those years, uh, coming out of that whole idea of, of being horrified of paying people to play football, uh, for 10 or 15 years, the pro football players were just considered, they were looked down on by society. It was like, oh, these are guys that don't have anything better to do. Yeah. Why would you ever do that? They, have nothing, they were kind of ne'er-do-wells, you know, that, that whole thing. So uh, by, the, by 1940, I would say, there was, en there was enough fan interest in games and enough good football being played as a result of rule changes they've made that I think people were starting to say, huh, this is kind of interesting. It's different than college football. Uh, these are grown men. The, 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 uh, the, the collisions are harder. The passes are stronger. The runners are faster. This is kind of interesting. So I would say 20 to 25 years. Of course, then you run right into World War II. Uh, so after the war, I would say, is really when that took off. Yeah, that was going to be my question. As soon as you said it took to about the 40s, so how did World War II affect the league? Because uh, hell, um, uh, Ted, uh, oh, the, the baseball player, uh, you know, uh, he, he, the, the best baseball players, the best football players, the best athletes in the world were going, uh, Ted Williams. Man, I couldn't believe I couldn't get that. Ted Williams goes <laughs> off to the war. Um, in the prime of his career. You know, all of these incredible athletes are going off in the prime of their career to serve their country. How did the NFL survive that? Did they uh, have to shorten the season? Did they have to use, you know, quote unquote, replacement players? What did they have to do? Well, over half the league went into the war and a bunch of guys didn't come back. It's very poignant. Yeah. Uh, the, and they did, the, these owners though made the decision, we're going to keep playing. Of course, baseball did as well. Uh, they just sort of took the, the lead of baseball with uh, President Roosevelt's the green light letter, it's called, that told, told baseball to keep playing because the public needed it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a diversion. So football kept going. They were, they didn't have the infrastructure or the popularity of the baseball. It's, they really struggled uh, at first uh, just to field teams. Uh, and what happened was uh, they merged, a couple of teams merged just to make it through, just to fill out a schedule. Uh, there's a, 
you know, some of them there, there to go back and look in, in NFL history, 1943, the Eagles and the Steelers merged and they were the Steagles. <laughs> and, uh, and they, they actually had a winning team. Wow. They, they had a, they put a winning team out there. And uh, then the next year, uh, the Steelers, again, Art Rooney was such pro was such a league guy that they said, we need you to merge with the Eagles. He said, I don't want to do it, but okay. Then the next year, they said, we need you to merge with the Cardinals so we can at least have a league. And he said, I don't want to do it again. And, but he said, okay, now that team was bad. Uh, and it was known, if you look at 1944 NFL standings, Card hyphen Pitt. Oh. Card Pitt is a team. And they didn't win a game. And so, uh, but the strangest thing happened, just to finish the story, the strangest sure. thing happened was attendance picked up. People wanted football. And so college football, there were a lot of schools that didn't have teams because their, their pool was really all in the war. Mm -hmm. So the pros, they played, and I think more people discovered it during the war, and they actually came out of World War II sort of ready to leap forward. Well, that goes back to my open when we're talking about um, people need that distraction. You know, the, the world itself at that point especially was incredibly dangerous, incredibly stressful. And they, even if it's just for a couple of hours to sit and watch, you know, men run around and, and occasionally throw a football, uh, it was probably just a, a welcome break for them. I, I can totally understand it. Um, so that seems weird. So I can totally get the logistics of the Steelers and the Eagles merging. Weren't the, weren't the Cardinals in Chicago? Weren't yes. They in, so that, that's a much more difficult, you know, that, that's quite a, quite a ways away, isn't it? But they, oh, they yeah. found a way. It huh? made no sense. It, it, it made no sense. And it was just a desperate move to, we, we need eight teams so we can have a league. And uh, most of the players were gone and they were just uh, looking for guys. Uh -huh. uh, by 44, actually, some, I, I take that back, some were starting to come back a, a little bit. But uh, they, it was just, they were just trying to do what they could to keep from shutting it down. And uh, so they just said, we have to do this. And yeah, it didn't make any sense, but uh, it's, it's what they did. It's what they felt they had to do to have a league and a season. So were there any, what were, in your opinion, kind of the deciding moments? You know, we, we've, been, we've talked a couple times now that it was really hit or miss. There were, it was, the odds were just as good that it would fail as it would succeed. Were there a couple of defining moments that were, when we said, okay, now we're going to make it. We, we can kind of, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is going to make it. We're, it's going to be viable going forward. Were there a couple of those points? Well, I can certainly point to one. There was one moment, 1936, they started the draft. Ah. Uh, that's just, to me, the key moment uh, in terms of sort of organizing the league to go forward. At that point, there were haves and have nots. There was no system of distributing college talent. It was complete free for all. Any player who wanted to play pro football could hang his shingle out and every team could make him an offer. And so the rich were getting richer is what was happening. The car, the, uh, I'm sorry, the giants were good. The bears were good. And, uh, Bert Bell stood up at a league meeting. He three years in with the Philadelphia Eagles. They were the worst team in the league. And he said, gentlemen, uh, I'm going to be out of business here if we don't figure out some way to do this. And he proposed the draft, you know, where the worst team gets the first pick and all that, what we now know so well. And so what happened was George Hallis and Tim Mara, who were on top, uh, listen, and in one minute, and they realized this would end their rule. It right. would, no longer would dominate. However, uh, no league is, is worth it. The, the most important thing of a league is if you don't know who's going to win and it needs to be competitive, they signed off on it immediately. And so that's a real turning point, 1936, I think, going forward. Now, you didn't really see the impact of it until after World War II. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was a moment when uh, uh, you saw the, you could sort of see the future coming. Uh, after World War II, um, uh, I would say there was one of the moments, there's a famous championship game in 1940, right before the war, where the uh, Bears beat the Redskins 73 to nothing. Oh, boy. Um, it's the most lopsided game, championship game ever. But it was an amazing game. Incredible football being played by the Chicago Bears. And I think uh, the country was fascinated by that. 
uh, just a complete blowout and tremendous football being played. Better football than you could see you know, on a college field. And they, they had this really sort of newfangled offense and were a great team, the Bears, right before the war. I think that was a moment. Uh, people were so fascinated by that. And, and then uh, you, you get into after World War II and 19, after World War II, the NFL was, uh, there was a, a challenger, the All-American Football Conference. And so they battled for four years with them. And then when they pretty much put that league out of business and merged and basically annexed Cleveland Browns and the San Francisco 49ers, right. suddenly going into the 50s, there's 12 teams, pretty good teams. They had some history. And at that point, and so we're 30 years in, at that point, it's like, okay, I, 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 th I think this is going to make it. So you mentioned um, you mentioned the draft, and you mentioned the fact that now every team was was able to kind of spread the wealth around a little bit. But then at the same time, you also didn't have free agency then either, right? So they would draft that person, and, and that person was theirs forever. So it kind of went from one way to the other way. You know, went from okay, Chicago gets everybody to now everybody is leveled out, but you can't move at all. Until right. what the late '60s, early '70s, or so, when when free agency became, uh, well, got instituted, yeah, and then and then right. so then then you kind of then it's the best of both worlds. Now we can draft them here, and then if you don't like your situation, you're able to go ahead and, and make it better somewhere else. But um, that's interesting how you went from, you know, the, you it was good initially. It was good for the well, I guess it was good for the players originally, right? Because they get the most Not money good. with the Bears. No. No, nope. not good for the, it was good for the bears. I mean, it, it was not good for the players. And so 25 years later, there's a players union, no coincidence. Right. Right. Uh, so, you know, that was a beating of that, that, I mean, as much as these, these owners wanted to level the playing field, I, I think it also, they didn't mind the fact that they didn't have to, they didn't have to uh, compete with each other anymore for these players. It would keep prices down. It was very, very important in that regard too. And so you also mentioned the AAFC, and and again, I'm I'm from Cleveland, so they always touted all of the the Browns championships that they had. They weren't Super Bowl championships; they were all championships prior to joining the the NFL. But there have been several challenges to the NFL over the years. You know, again, the 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 AFL, the USFL, the XFL, the AAC, I think is what they were calling it this year. How has the NFL been able to one maybe it's a two-part question why are these teams thinking that they can especially now challenge goliath you know why does the why does the xfl think that they have a shot at this point and at the but at the time how did the nfl hold off some of these other teams and why not just integrate them why not just take them in especially like the afl with the, the chiefs and the broncos and the, the chargers and all those teams that now are part of the nfl what was the reasoning to make them form their own league rather than just accept them? Well, uh, what happened, and I actually wrote about this in another of my books, A 10-Gallon War, is about uh, the beginning of the AFL-NFL War in 1960 in Dallas, my old hometown, Yeah, where suddenly there were, there, there were no teams in 1959, and then both leagues put a team in there in 1960. And what happened, why the AFL started, Lamar Hunt, who was uh, the son of probably the richest man in America, H.L. Hunt was an oil man. He was 26 years old, <laughs> and he wanted to get into the NFL. Uh, he was just a sports fan, nice kid, and he wanted to get into the NFL. He tried to buy the Cardinals. He went up and talked to Hallis, uh, you know, and then Hallis just completely ran the league. They had what was called an expansion committee. It was Hallis. He was mm -hmm. the expansion committee. And so they didn't want to expand because they fought so long to make some money. And finally, when television came in in the 50s, just as they were getting popular, television came in. Finally, there was money on the table for the first time. They didn't want to cut the pie up. They were so excited. They're finally making money. And so there were all these cities that wanted in. And the NFL was just no, no, no. And Lamar Hunt wants in no. And so Lamar Hunt, who's richer than all of them combined, said, all right, well, I'm starting my own league. And he did it very innocently. I knew Lamar. Uh, and uh, he did do it very innocently. He said, well, we're just going to start a league. I don't know that it'll be a threat to the NFL, but we have all these guys that want in. There's one in Houston. There's, 
and let's see how it works. And so very quickly, of course, I mean, the NFL went on high alert and tried right. to squash them. But the thing is, that's the one time NFL did not squash them. The AFL had a lot of things going for them. They were much more diverse. Uh, they had they had wealthy owners. Uh, they had oil guys, and uh, they had some good ideas. It's exciting football, and so they were a real challenge to the NFL. And that's why, in the end, after ten years, there was a, a true merger, and they took all those teams. Uh, and so. Uh, the, the AFL truly brought the NFL to its knees. Uh, I mean, the, the NFL said, we have to, we have to merge. We can't, we're not going to knock you out of business. We're right. Merge. So it, to their, it's one of the great victories ever that the AFL was able to do that. Well, and, and I always looked at that like kind of like the ABA and the NBA, you know, they had a, yeah. they, they were playing the same game, but to all appearances, they were playing it differently, at least in, in, in my opinion of the AFL. You know, um, whether it be uh, you know Eric Oriel or, or some of these some of these teams that are just the forward pass, you know, really making that just playing the game maybe a little bit differently and adding and having some different rule sets and and um, just a, a little bit a little bit fresher. And it, it's interesting when you have that ability to sit back and just study something, and you can study the NFL and say, okay, this is what they do right now. These are the things I think we could fix. And and the XFL does that quite a bit too. The XFL. Yeah. has a lot of uh, little rule tweaks and, and new things. And some of them are good and some of them aren't. But you have the ability to sit back and say, okay, what are they doing well? What can they improve on? And then you can incorporate that. Um, that was really interesting. I also, because I wasn't around for the AFL. I was around for the USFL and, and seeing, um, you know, whether Steve Young or Herschel Walker or some of the, you know, these incredible Hall of Fame NFL players who were on in the USFL, um, how did, even at that point, 1984, I mean, by then the NFL was well established. Yeah. What was the, uh, the impetus of the USFL? Do you know why they did this, you know, why they came in and thought they could challenge? Well, they originally wanted to play spring football and uh, they did just play football was so popular the yeah. late, by the, in the late seventies, early eighties, let's play at a different time of year. Let's capture that market. Uh, so let's try it in a different, it was a, a brainstorm. Uh, let's, let's, let's try a different time of year. And so it started out as that, and it was kind of an interesting idea. And then they played in stadiums and people of America so love football that there were some crowds. Yeah. Uh, it failed. I mean, Donald Trump came in and we don't have to go down that road, but, uh, you know, that did not, uh, I think in the long run help. And, uh, they moved to the fall and they just... Then they were gone. Uh, you know, they sued and, and they were gone within three years. So those teams didn't have a chance to develop. The, I would say this, <clears throat> the football relative to the NFL, the football played in the USFL was uh, far below the caliber of the NFL. Not true mm -hmm. of the AFL in the 60s and not. It was basically true through a lot of, for a lot of the All-American Football Conference back in the late 40s, except the Cleveland Browns. Uh, who were the champions of that league, really put the whole league out of business. They came right in and were dominant in the NFL. They were, that was a great football team. So the NFL took the, they plucked the good teams from that league. There were just a couple. Uh, and uh, they merged with the AFL uh, because there was good football being played there and uh, not true of the USFL. And the leagues now, the XFL and all this, they do have some interesting ideas and some fun ideas. And I'm all for it. I mean, you know, liven up the game a little yeah. bit. I think the, they're going to have a hard time. Uh, you're just, you're just, uh, you know, you're taking on such uh, these, 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 inst these teams are all these franchises. There's so much history, tradition, so many fans. Uh, it's, it's maybe the pie's bigger and you can cut out a slice. I, I don't think you're going to cut out a very big slice. Has there ever been a, a serious um, discussion regarding a developmental league. I mean, I, I know the NBA has a developmental league. Major League Baseball has the minor leagues. Has there ever been a, a serious discussion in the NFL to say, okay, XFL, you play from you know April through early August or early you know late July, whatever, and you are the development the developmental league, the people, the guys who don't make the XFL instead of going on the quote unquote practice squad, you go to 
uh, you know, the Orlando Shock or whatever the, the heck the team is. Has there ever been a any discussion like that? Why won't why are they resistant to that kind of development? I think the World League of America, the World League, that was another one. Uh -huh. They played in Europe. I think there was a tie-in there. Yeah. Uh, there was some, that was deemed something of a developmental league, uh, and so um, you know, I, I, very honestly, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, they are, they don't want to pay for a developmental system. I mean, in baseball, there's a tremendous amount of money, R and D, yeah. research and development money, goes down the drain in the minor leagues. Uh, and I think football would love to not have to pay that. And I think that they can get away with it because the college system is such a great training ground yeah, and sure. they're not paying for it. So uh, other people are paying for it. I mean, that, that may be a cynical approach, but uh, I think there's some truth to it. So you, you mentioned the, the implementation of the advent of television. What was the impact of television and televised games and night games on the popularity of the NFL at the time? Just transformative, just totally groundbreaking. And I actually trace that in the book. Um, the Before 1950, which is, as I say, the red light came on in 1950, pretty much when these networks started showing games and the coaxial cable was making it from coast to coast and suddenly people in Omaha could watch uh, the games um, before then, uh, the championship games in the late forties, one was played in a snowstorm in Philadelphia. There were 20,000 people there and you know, I don't know how many people saw it. Uh, then the television comes in, they start showing these games, uh, around the country out of market, which is key, which starts to develop, uh, uh, fans in other right. places. And by the, the last chapter in my book, 1958 championship game, so-called greatest game ever played Baltimore Colts the New York Giants in overtime uh, in uh, New York, the NFL championship game, 40 million people watched that. Wow. And so you started the decade with 20,000 people in a snowstorm in Philadelphia, and you get near the end of it with 40 million people watching your championship game. Uh, and television has a great deal to do with it. So that is really from the darkness into the light. Have, do you have any fear now? Now we've got to the point, though, where – the level of production, uh, the production quality of the broadcast itself, the televisions themselves, 85 inches HD quality. Uh, you know, I got Tony Romo over here doing play by play, you know, just fabulous. Uh, tell, tell me what Tom Brady's going to do with the ball before he even snaps the ball. Uh, now the, the experience of the game is almost so much, uh, well, for some people, it's better sitting at home and watching it than it would be to go, you know, do I want to go to the dog pound? You know, again, being from Cleveland, do I want to go to the dog pound when it's 12 degrees outside and snowing uh, you know, and to watch that game? Or do I want to sit back in my, in my man cave with my, the fire going and again, on my huge television and, and uh, watch the game and get all of the impact of the, of the commentary and the replays and all that other stuff. Is there, is the television process now? Is it hurting the game at all, or is that money still so just astronomical that it makes up for any inconvenience or any lost gate or anything like that, and, and they just don't care? I would say both. I would say it is hurting to the point. It's hurting the live gate for sure. I think teams are worried about it for all the, that exact situation that you mentioned. Uh, they've built, they play in these 70,000 seat stadiums, right. uh, and you know they're not always full. And it's very, it's a lovely thing to stay home on a Sunday and, and, and watch, you know, you can do something else at halftime or whatever. And uh, 70 inch HD, you just can't beat it. And Absolutely. so it's a problem. The grass and, uh, the looks league, better. The grass looks better on my television than it looks in real life. I mean, yeah. it, it is. And just to get uh, just another example, I, I actually live in St. Augustine, Florida now. So the Jaguars are, are the hometown team. My wife and I went to a Jaguar game this year. We went to the first game of the season against the Kansas City Chiefs. It was 120 degrees in the stadium. <laughs> I'm not joking. That is not, a, that is not an exaggeration. Uh, they were busing people to the hospital. People were, yeah. were just falling out from the heat because Jacksonville does not have a dome. For whatever reason, it's almost impossible to go to a September game here. Um, so that's another thing. So we left after the first quarter, which is in because the, the Chiefs, uh, were one of my favorite teams as well. I was a big Marty Schottenheimer fan when he, when he coached the Browns. 
he left and went to the Chiefs, and then I became a Chiefs fan for about 10 years until he left. So really excited to go. It was an anniversary present. We lasted one quarter because it was so hot, and then we went home, and I watched it on my television. So, uh, you know, I just wondered if that's – if the television – is really impacting, uh, you know, the the future of the league at all, or is it just, hey, we have so much money from Directv, from CBS, from uh, Fox, or whomever else does those games, we don't care. Well, that's the second part of the equation. Yeah, I think they're okay because of that reason. I mean, the, the TV contracts are huge, uh, and it's more, much greater percentage of the revenues than in baseball, just because uh, it's so popular. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt they lose uh, money if, take, say, you know, fanless games or whatever comes down the pike. I mean, who knows? I mean, ticket revenue is still integral to, to their business model and everything. But the national TV money just changes everything. And so they'll put up with anything uh, to get their hands on that money uh, because it's just tremendous. But uh, and I think going forward, they, they just uh, the NFL signed a collective bargaining agreement uh, within the past few months. And that's a green light to start negotiating TV contracts. That will be big. People hmm. still watch football on television. For sure. They may watch it online. They may watch it on Twitter, like the Thursday night games or whatever. Uh, different places stream it. But it's still by by and large a TV experience. And so it still has value. And they, they're expecting to cash in on those things. So. Uh, with the CBA settled. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll, but, you know, on the other hand, more and more people staying away. Uh, it's, it's just interesting to watch to see how it all plays out. Sure. Uh, I have a couple more questions. Uh, and my first one is if the, if the five gentlemen in your book were living today, and uh, say they, they, they rose back up today and they took a look at the NFL today, what do you think they would think about the NFL as it stands right now, whether it be, the rules, the rules changes, you know, the more offensive versus defensive play, uh, f- safety reasons, things like that, how, how those television contracts are, are made. Uh, what do you think they would think of the current NFL? Number one, they'd be really happy. Yeah. <laughs> because it's really a lot bigger than when they were, you know, driving buses uh, through central Pennsylvania to get to road trips. Mm-hmm. So no question, they would be happy. And they're problem solvers. Uh, they weren't perfect. Uh, they, they made mistakes. I mean, George Preston Marshall's one of the great racists in the history of American sports. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they made a lot of mistakes, uh, uh, you know, but the, collaboratively it worked and uh, their sense of purpose was right. And I do believe whatever, it's very hard to put these guys are all sort of old school for lack mm-hmm. of a better term, put them in today's NFL. It's kind of hard to imagine. They were smart. And resourceful and i'm sure they would adapt and uh if someone presented them with the information that you know uh we got an issue with concussions uh or whatever they wouldn't say this they wouldn't just go ah forget it they they would say okay well we have to deal with this uh and uh, i i'm sure they would be right in the middle of all of it uh and understand that uh, the challenges are are very very different i will say this i i asked in my research george hallis's uh uh, daughter Virginia McCaskey is still alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, she owns the Chicago Bears. Uh, she's 96 years old, uh, and you know they're worth three billion dollars or whatever it is. Wow! And so I was able to arrange an interview with her. And I went out to Chicago, uh, and her son runs the Bears. And and so I, I went out and I interviewed her, and I, I asked that question basically: What would it, it, uh, what's the lesson if, if they could speak to us from the grave you know what what would they say and, and she thought about that and she says you know uh you know my dad and all those men uh what they the thing they always did year in and year out regardless of what was going on they said the first thing you have to do is take care of the game ahead of everything else i'm ta- i'm saying not talking about the money not talking about any of that don't you know make sure you make sure the game is good protect it you know if you see something wrong with the rules or player safety or whatever it may be you have to address this or if something's gotten boring or something's unfair uh always she said you know and she comes from an era and that's what i write about is that rules changing the rules always was paramount the thing they did what can we do to make it fair more interesting everything and that is still going on yes that goes on every year and so 
uh, that's part of that process. And, uh, you know, these were guys, these were sportsmen, and they said, you know, but the pro football's ticket is that it's different than college football, uh, and how is it going to be different? And let's make sure that we make the product interesting. I'm not sure they're always succeeding these days, mm -hmm. but uh, they, they, they are trying uh, to do that. And I, I think that's what the, they would bring to the table. No doubt, they love the money. Uh, and maybe they would look at things today and say, you know, maybe there's a little bit too much influence, too much uh, emphasis on that uh, right now instead of the game. Uh, so maybe they would reverse that, however slightly. What do you think it is about football? I mean, I, I'm going to make a statement here, and I don't, I don't know that it's debatable, but maybe somebody will debate me. What do you think it is that has allowed the NFL to wrestle – America's pastime away from Major League Baseball. I don't think it's even close anymore. I think that um, Major League Baseball hasn't been America's pastime since I was a very young child. I think that now it is football, 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 football. If it's not during the season, you are gearing up for the combine. I watch the combine. It, it's silly, but I watch it. Uh, I watch the draft. I, I follow, uh, you know, the the free agency period. I follow the the, the workouts before the season. I follow, I watch the the preseason games. What is it about football itself, about the game, but the, the way it's played, or what have you, that has taken that? title away from Major League Baseball, which has a much longer season, gives you a lot more time to go out and, and really become invested in the team. There's only 16 games in the NFL. Each yep. one of those games feels like life and death because there are only 16 opportunities for your team to win. There aren't 162. Um, maybe I'm answering my own question. But what do you think um, in terms of the appeal of football that has uh, made it such America's pastime? Well, that, that's a, we could do a whole show on that. I think it's very it's very interesting uh, question, and uh, you know I, I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, baseball, uh, I think, made uh, you know the things have been different, and I'm a baseball fan. I yeah, love baseball, and uh, you know I, I go to games, and I've written books about it, and you know. I, coach my son's teams and you know all that i love it yeah so but but i i agree that uh football has surpassed it uh, and it's a combination of a number of factors uh, i think uh you know for better or worse i, I think uh, i think baseball uh has had more labor issues uh with a stronger union in baseball for sure which good for them Mm -hmm. uh, and those baseball players are, are making out better, but there's been a lot of sort of strife there. There's more contention in baseball. I think football, not that they've lacked for it, but, uh, you know, they've settled this and they put in a salary cap, which level the playing field. Football very much has a, le I think has a leveler playing field than I baseball. Agree. Yeah. Uh, and so you don't know who's going to win. Let's, let's boil it down to that. Yes. We've come through a Patriot dynasty here. Good for them. Right. Uh, but, you know, year in and year out, uh, I think it's you don't know in any game what's going to happen because the playing field is really level in football. Uh, I think also the fact that you mentioned um, just 16 games, every game, every game has meaning. Uh, every even two, three and 11 teams playing in December, there's draft status or right, something right. going on or somebody quarterbacks trying to prove themselves. Uh, every game has something. And they're all epic in their own way uh and there's definitely something to be said for the the violence of it uh i think people are fascinated by that and uh, finally another thing would be i think it plays really well on television i mean they've I done agree. a nice job of making right. baseball better uh but in the early days of television and i write about this baseball really struggled and football became the sport of television because it was the perfect theater 100 100 yard you know, that's all it was. And you could really zero in on things. And, uh, you know, so it's a number of factors, I think, that, that, that go into play. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, there, there's no question now that baseball lags, lags way behind football, For sure. which, you know, sort of is sad to me. I love baseball, but uh, I, I think it's true. No, I agree with you. I, I like baseball as well. I mean, I, again, I grew up in Cleveland. And, and when I was well, I came from the really bad Indians teams to the early 90s where they were really good Indian teams. Um, so a lot of great memories of baseball as well. But you know what? I didn't even think about it, and you're absolutely right. I think there is a an appeal to the fact that the Jaguars could 
win this year. I mean, they could be in the they could be in the Super Bowl this year. Who knows? Um, you you get those those sudden swings of fortune in the NFL that you just don't get in Major League Baseball. You could almost you could uh, throw chicken bones down and, and read it and say, okay, the Dodgers, the Cardinals, the Yankees, and the Red Sox are going to be in the playoffs. Right. Uh, well, of course they are every year. Uh, whereas in the NFL, I think it's something like every year five or six of the of the playoff teams from the last year don't make it into the playoffs the next year. It's five or six new teams. So it keeps those, it keeps those, you know, it keeps the Bengals invested. You know, it keeps the Bucks, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers invested. Sure. We could be there. It could be us. Um, you're right. I think that you're right about that. Uh, but you also mentioned something about, um, you know, always, always innovating and always changing. And also in the NFL, it's a copycat league. You've heard that said a million times. Uh, it's a, you know, with innovations are dissected and they're copied regularly. And so I want to talk to you actually about the Ravens now with uh, Lamar Jackson and what they're kind of doing with Lamar Jackson, taking that unique talent. He has a unique talent and skill set, which in the past Cordell Stewart would have been made a wide receiver or Antoine Randall L would have been a wide receiver or Heinz Ward would have been a wide receiver because he was a great athlete, maybe not the best quarterback. Uh, you know, they are, they're going to try to shoehorn you in there like Randall Cunningham or you're going to be something else, or you're going to be on the trash heap like um, uh, Griffin, uh, Robert Griffin, unfortunately. Right. They took the chance and said, we're going to build our team around your skill set. We're going to put some workhorses back there with you. And by, by the way, again, Ohio State's my alma mater. J.K. Dobbins is awesome. J.K. Dobbins is going to be a great player. In good draft pick. Oh, that was so good when I watched that. Uh, I hated that he went to the Ravens because, again, I, I grew up in Cleveland. But at I felt great for him because it's a great spot for him. He's going to be do really, really well there. But they changed everything. Do you do you think they're being uh, kind of have your finger on the pulse there? Do you realize or do they know that this could be it? You know, and suddenly now other teams are going to be taking chances on those guys who who there was some question about their quarterbacking ability, but there's no question about their athleticism. And maybe bringing them in and morphing their entire offensive structure around those people because it's working so well in Baltimore. Do you think that do you can you see that happening around the league? Uh, well, I, I think the change that's happened is that teams are now open to it. They're yeah. willing to do it. They will be willing to do it, having seen what happens with Lamar Jackson. Whether there's another Lamar Jackson coming along is big is the question. Right. Uh, yeah, and then sure there will be, but uh, you know, they're, they're not many. So the, the, you know, the Ravens just made the decision. They had won a Super Bowl with Joe Flacco. They had been in the playoffs for many years with Joe Flacco. They'd sort of hit a patch where they were about 500 team with Flacco for a number of years. And uh, they made the decision organizationally. And I give them great credit. They said, listen, we're all looking right. all for a new quarterback, the NFL. And this is true in every team going back a few years. We're all looking for the next Brady or the next Peyton Manning a next drop back, beautiful, cerebral, you know, the whole Absolutely. quarterback. And so why, how many are there? They're just not very many. So I've, I've, I've sat in on rants with John Harbaugh has said this, you know, he said, there's just not very many. Why don't we try it another way? And so here's this kid and he's a super talent. And what happened was they brought him in and they probably already knew this behind the scenes. What they found was, Super high football IQ, mm -hmm. the uh, ability to dissect the field on the go, really, really good. And the, some of those first spring practices, they were like, whoa, the coaches were like, this, this is pretty good here. We knew he's a good, good athlete and all that, but he's, he's got some things going for him. And so uh, all it took was one half season. They said, well, you know, he's, he's got enough that we're going to do this. So they are trying in a different way, running the ball. It's what they've always wanted to For do sure. anyway. So it's 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 counterintuitive to way to the way pro football is played elsewhere with passing, passing, passing. I applaud them, and it certainly worked. They've got Lamar though, so uh, you know whether whether that leads to the, the beauty of it. Of course, is that now you know other African American quarterbacks are going right. to have a better chance. Finally, sure. long overdue on that. So that's a wonderful thing. Uh, you even, know whether they succeed like Lamar does. But even we'll then, it, it's a, it's a. But even then, even black or white, it's, it's a type. 
you know, Steve Young could throw, but Steve Young yeah. is incredibly athletic. And if they had, you know, done that same type of thing, Steve Young could have worked in there just as easily. But yes. yeah, what, what if, you know, Michael Vick had a great career in his own right, but what if they had molded the backfield to what Michael Vick's skill set was right. and not tried to shoehorn him in and, and that same old tired, this is the way we've always done it. The guy's always taken a three-step drop, stood over and, and surveyed the field. Uh, you, you know, every now and then, and I and you got to give credit, guys like Harbaugh credit for having the strength of the conviction to say, we're going to take a shot because it could have flamed out. It could have flamed out terribly. It could have been a terrible decision. They could have had a terrible year. Instead, they're just Mack trucking people and running <laughs> and running over people. Yeah. It's beautiful to watch. Beautiful. Harbaugh was in the last year of his contract when he made that. Decision. Yeah. He was on the hot seat. Yeah, absolutely. He took a huge <laughs> risk to do that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and again, there's nothing more demoralizing than knowing that we're going to run on you and you can't stop it. And they just keep yeah. running on you. It, it's, I hear I sound like I'm a Baltimore lover here, but I, I do love that system. I think it's fabulous, and, and it was an incredible gutsy uh, play to just say, he has these talents, let's work with them. Um, so, okay, my last question tonight then is, uh, with all the changes that are going on, what do you see? You know, you're, you're, you're right there, you're in the, in the organization, as it were. What do you see for the NFL in the next five years? What do you think, uh, you know, these, these five guys, they started it here, where are we going to be five years from now? Well, I don't. I mean, there's a, there's a. It's an interesting time in the NFL. Uh, uh, they certainly went through the thing uh, three or four years ago with, uh, uh, you know, the. Uh, I mean, the fans. Some of the fans got upset with some of the social protests, yeah. and it certainly was an issue in Baltimore, uh, and lost some fans there, and uh, you know, it was a very sort of polarizing issue, and it took a while for them to come back uh from that uh and they have uh you know the television ratings were really strong last year now, now the stadiums some of them are not quite as full as they were i think that's another issue i yeah. think you're gonna see that in all sports i think all these stadiums might be a little big now for those reasons you mentioned earlier right yeah television so we'll see so uh, the biggest thing i mean having come through that sort of crucible uh you know it's certainly going to try to handle the, this situation uh, you know, the concussion issue, the head trauma issue is certainly one that, that bears watching. Uh, the league, I can tell you, very, very concerned about it. Uh, and they're doing what they can, my observation. You know, there's a lot of a lot going into helmet technology and, and things. Whether they can make a difference, I don't know. Or what mm -hmm. the situation is. There's, uh, again, we could do a whole show on sort of that whole issue. Right. Uh, but so I think, though, short term, I think the league is 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 pretty healthy. Pretty I mean, solid. people are, are just dying to see it play, you know, see football this year. But that, that speaks to itself right there more than any sport. So, you know, that that craving tells you right there. I think I think uh, the, their product is desired and you can't ask for much more than that. Well, absolutely. I agree 100 percent. Like I told you before we even started, my, my father's been hounding me to to talk some sports and to have some uh, uh, some sports people on because he's been jonesing like the rest of us have, uh, you know. Right right now, again, he'd be watching the Reds and getting ready for the for the Bengals season, but um, but it's just been an open hole, big hole so far this year, and it's amazing how quiet it is when when you don't hear when there is no sports around and the world's just silent and yeah. you need that distraction. Un unfortunately, you definitely do, or you start to think about you know, all these other things going on. But uh, thank you so much for John for joining the show. Uh, would you like to spend just a moment? I don't know if you're working on any other books right now, or, I mean, I know you probably don't have any speaking engagements or things like that, but anything no. else that you wanted to promote or that you're working on? Uh, I, I do not have another book uh, project yet. Uh, I'll probably have one within the year. Probably it'll probably be football again, mm -hmm. but uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I just am working, uh, uh, you know, for the Ravens website. I did start a podcast last fall. Awesome. Uh, it's a Baltimore Ravens podcast. Uh, it's about, however, former players in life after football, sort of a narrative storytelling podcast. It's called what happened to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I, I did a season last year with former players and what happened to them. Some did well, some had not done well. And I'll do that again this fall. So I would encourage people to, to get on, uh, see if you can find ball. Actually, anywhere you get a podcast, Baltimore Ravens podcast, it'll come up. 
And uh, I had a lot of fun with that. That's sort of where my uh, non-writing energies have gone. No, that's an, that's an awesome idea. I love when you, you see things like that. And what has this person done after, after football yeah. or, you know, um, unfortunately, a lot of the times you, you, you hear about them and, and they've fallen on hard times you know, they don't have a, a lot of experience managing money or things like that. And, and suddenly it's, it's gone, it's gone in an instant. Uh, but that's, that's really interesting. That's a, a great topic. Um, oh, I, I could go wild. I did eight episodes. I could do 20, just, sure. uh, you know, falling on hard times. I did Trevor Price. I don't remember was a defensive lineman that yes. played 15 years for Broncos. Well, he's now. He's like making it in Hollywood. He, he, he's written a show, an animated uh, show uh, with superhero frogs in Australia that's been three years on Netflix. And he's this incredibly creative guy. And uh, I was like, this is such that's a great awesome. story. I, you know, I, I really had a lot of fun with stories like that. That, that, is, that is super awesome. By the way, I do have a book, uh, a book idea for you. If you're thinking about it, <laughs> uh, I think you should write a book regarding... Art Modell stealing the Browns in the middle of the night and taking them over to Baltimore and calling them the Ravens. It's a, it's yeah. a good story. I'm telling you, there are there, not many days go by when I don't think to myself, we had Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick was our coach. It was the Browns coach. It right. could have been the Browns the dynasty. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows yeah, what it's, it's all true. Those were very wrenching times. Uh... It was very interesting in Baltimore uh, when they took Cleveland's team, you know. Yeah. And I was riding in Baltimore. And, uh, of course, Indianapolis had taken Baltimore's team 10 years earlier. Right, yeah. It goes and around. And so a lot of the public – I recently gave a speech in Canton, Ohio at the Hall of Fame. And they said, well, what do you think about that, how all that worked out? And I said, well, you know, people in Baltimore were sort of like, wow, we really did that? Yeah. Uh, we were glad we have a team and all that, but I mean, some things are not black and white. That's all I can say. There's gray area. And people were like, wow, I can't believe that's how it came down. Yo, no, I, yeah, I was only half joking. So, I think that would be a great story. I, you know, yeah. I think that would be a really interesting story. I'd buy it for sure. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so once again, everybody, johneisenberg.com. You're also on Twitter, right? It's uh, B More Eisenberg is the right. Twitter handle. And yes. again, look for your where are they where are they now? What was the name of the podcast? What happened to that guy? What happened to that guy podcast for John Eisenberg? That's a great name. It's a great idea. I love it. Uh, thank you so much, John, for joining the show. I really appreciate it. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good afternoon or evening. Bye. Thank you. All right. So that was John Eisenberg. We <laughs> talked some football today. Uh, great conversation. Uh, really had a good time. Talked about the origin origin of the league and where it came from, where it's going to, and what do we have to look forward to in the future. And again, I, you know, we, we talked about the, the Ravens a little bit. I have no real allegiance to the Ravens, but I do respect what the coaching staff and what Jim Harbaugh and what the team did to acknowledge the talent that they had, mold their offense so that that they could make the best use of what they had. And they really have taken the the NFL by storm the last couple of years uh, in doing it in just an awesome way. I mean, there really is nothing more demoralizing than just getting run over constantly knowing it's coming. You can't stop it. I mean, that's the greatest thing in the world. You know, passing is all about misdirection. It really is. You know, I'm, I'm play actioning. I'm I'm looking over at this guy over here to, to faint you off. And then I throw to the, to the guy on the left running, we're just coming at you. We're just going to run you over. We're just going to knock you down and run past you. It is uh, a demoralizing thing when you can run on a team and they can't stop it. Uh, it, was re- it was super interesting to kind of get an idea of how close the NFL was on multiple occasions to folding. You know, the, the real challenge that the AFL posed, uh, how they were able to... Um, you know, work change with the times, implement or integrate some of the other teams that were coming in from some of the other leagues that were also um, coming up and still deciding to challenge the NFL. I do think eventually the the television and the production and the comfort of being inside and watching games, eventually it's going to hurt the NFL in some way. I mean, I guess you can make, a, make it up with the television money. But you're going to probably eventually start contracting stands. Instead of a 60,000-seat arena, you're going to have maybe a 
thousand seat, forty five thousand seat. Save yourself some money on the construction because you're not going to have as many people coming in. Maybe you can make the experience better. You know, you can cut twenty thousand seats, but make some other amenities uh, in the stadium so those people who do really like being there because it's fun. You know, anything after October in Florida is a great game. Usually the weather is beautiful at that point. If you go in September or October, forget it. You're going to you're going to burn to death. You're going to be a charred cinder. You're going to be an ash sitting in the chair uh, at the end of the first quarter. You can't even enjoy the game. I mean, that Chiefs game we went to this year was unbearable. It's unfortunate. You know, we, you spend a lot of money to go to the game. You can only stay there for a quarter. So something has to happen in some of these markets like Jacksonville, like Tampa, like Miami, you know, where, you know, if you don't have a dome, um, you have to do something to, to find a reason to get people to come out to these games. And what are your thoughts? Uh, what do you thought about your team? Uh, what do you think about how they're utilizing uh, the, the offensive talent that they have there in Baltimore? What do you feel about just how the teams are going to start coming back in? Hopefully soon we're going to have a season this year. You have any comments or concerns or questions? You can contact us on the Prove Me Wrong Gmail account. It's Prove Me Wrongcast at gmail.com. You can also contact us on Facebook or Instagram. It's Prove Me Wrong, name of the show. It's easy to find. If you're looking for the podcast itself, you can find us really anywhere, any platform that carries podcasts. You can find the Prove Me Wrong podcast. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud, iTunes, anything you can think of, we're there. You can find us. Like and subscribe to the channel. You'll be the first to be notified when a new episode is released. We typically release an episode every week. Uh, we're also on YouTube, as you can see right here with a little YouTube scroll. If you like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, you'll also be notified when a brand new YouTube uh, version has come out every week, and you'll be the first ones to know. Um, it's just that simple. So like and subscribe to YouTube. Like and subscribe to uh the podcast itself, the audio version on wherever you listen to podcasts. The Prove Me Wrong podcast tonight is brought to you by Java Remix. Java Remix is a perfect blend of 100% organic Arabica coffee infused with nano emulsified CBD. Start your day off on the right foot with a great tasting cup of coffee with all the demonstrated benefits of pure CBD. Java Remix offers traditional ground coffee as well as single serve K cups in both regular and decaf. And if you aren't a coffee person, Java Remix also offers CBD-infused teas and beauty products like bath bombs and body scrubs. As an added benefit right now for all of our Prove Me Wrong listeners, if you go online, javaremix.com, put in the promo code PROVEMEWRONG, you'll get an additional 20% discount off of your entire shopping experience. Java Remix also offers free shipping on all orders over $40. You literally have no reason not to try it out. Once again, that's javaremix.com. Promo code Prove Me Wrong. The Prove Me Wrong podcast is brought to you tonight by Zendozone Citronella Burners from JT Eaton. They are shaped like fearless little tiki gods. So let Surf and Stan, Hawaiian Howie, and Luau Lily bring the islands to your backyard with Zendozone Citronella Burners. Zendozone's uses natural 3% citronella candles and incense cones. They're perfect for patios, decks, backyards, campsites, poolside, and more. You can enjoy the outdoors again. They are available on Amazon and at Ace Hardware stores. So go ahead and collect them all today. So once again, for my guest tonight, Mr. John Eisenberg, you can find him again on johneisenberg.com. Be More Eisenberg is his Twitter handle. I'm Pete Lieb. This is the Prove Me Wrong podcast. We'll talk to you again soon.